Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Classroom Matters podcast with me, your host, Christy Hool, where we dive into the hottest topics in education. Today, our guest is Bryson Tarbett. Now, Bryson is a pre-K to sixth grade general music teacher just outside of Columbus, Ohio. He spent his first year out of college as part of an elementary school intervention team where he fell in love with working with students with disabilities. Due to this experience, and as well as his own personal experience as a neurodiverse individual, Bryson feels strongly about advocating for sensory and emotionally inclusive classrooms. In addition to being a full-time elementary music teacher, he is also the founder of That Music Teacher, which is his online business that is dedicated to content-specific professional development for elementary music teachers. Oh, that's a lot, Bryson. Welcome to the show. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to see where we can take this discussion. Okay. I'm so excited. So normally I like to like talk a little bit at the beginning, but I feel like you have so much to offer our listeners that I'm just going to let you dive in with your background and how you got into the, the, the field of teaching and, and how you're currently like got to where you're doing the work that you are today. For sure. So it's definitely been a long journey and I've, it's, taken me in weird paths that I never thought I'd be here. Um, Starting back at the end of high school, I thought I was going to be the next great high school choir director and I was going to do all the things, you know, do the musical and all that stuff. And once I started in my undergrad training, I observed a high school teacher and I was like, this is not meant for me. And I was really heartbroken because like, this is what I was planning on. And, but thankfully the week after I was able to observe an elementary music classroom and my life changed forever. I went down, you started working at preschools during all the way through college and it just really fell in love with the early childhood elementary level um, in that music setting. And it, it was quite a interesting journey um, within my first year of teach or out of undergrad, I like I, like you said, I was working in an elementary school setting outside of the music classroom, which was great to be able to see context and see how um, special education services and education can work. Um, and, and it's just been great to be able to take that information. Uh, from what I've learned, as well as, like you said, me, myself, having ADHD and sensory processing disorder, and make the classroom that I wish I would have had as a kid. And because I know that there are kids out there like me that are trying to be successful and sometimes feel like the decks are stacked against them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I want to ask you a question about what what you just said about you started out wanting to maybe do high school. And then you switched over to the younger kiddos, right? Like preschool, elementary. Was it, what was the draw for you on that switch? Was it the age of the kids? Was it the the development, the behaviors of the kids? Was it the content and what you would be teaching? Like what kind of was the biggest sway for you to go from high school down to elementary age kids? To me, it really came down to just the magic of it. I love, you know, being able to see the kids light up when they, because everything's magical to a kindergartner. And, you know, I, it really just being able to observe that teacher that and and see how joyful music making could be in a way that, you know, we weren't fo- focusing on a concert. We weren't worried about competition. We were really just making music for the sake of making music together. And it was so play-based and we're up and moving and using instruments and and dancing. And it just it lit a part of me that I didn't realize I was missing in my own education. You know, a lot of my, especially, you know, middle school on was, you know, a formal music education where you're typically in an ensemble singing songs, you know, playing instruments and the, the creative, the act, the doing the, the singing, saying, playing and dancing wasn't really there. And I just instantly fell in love with it. And I've kind of stuck with it ever since. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because you, you actually answered the question that I was going to ask you if you felt a part of yourself, like your own personality sort of came to life when you switched and was working with some of the younger kiddos. So I think a lot of folks in just in education in general, you know, they come into their student teaching with sort of this pigeonhole, I want to work with this age of kids, right? And then when they get an experience with the different age, they're like, okay, well, maybe I was wrong because this age of kids actually is really what fills me up the most. So I think that it's important, you know, because a lot of folks listening are, you know, um, educators and parents and folks in school to be teachers. And so I think it's important that they're hearing your story about how you really felt that you were a high school teacher. And then once you got into the world of education, you really realized that that wasn't who you were 
at all based on the age of the kids. So let's talk a little bit about, because you've already talked about, you know, the sensory and emotionally inclusive classroom. So kind of give us an, an, a visual of what that looks like, what that feels like when you say that. One thing that really opened my eyes to what the music classroom could be is when I was outside of the music classroom, my, my first assignment out of undergrad was working in an autism classroom. And it really... I mean, I really had prior to that time really hadn't had much experience working with students with disabilities or working with, you know, sensory needs and things like that. And it became very apparent that small changes that we can make in our classrooms can make huge leaps. And when it comes to removing barriers for accessing um, for all types of students, all, you know, and what, what I love about what I've learned is the practices that I use in my classroom to make it sensory and emotionally friendly and accessible do that for everyone, not just someone on IEP, not just someone on a 504, not just someone with a formal diagnosis, but it really just removes that barrier for everyone and, and, and allows everyone to be set up for success, including myself as the teacher. Yeah. And and so as you're, as you're talking about making those things accessible to everyone, not just the students that have IEPs or 504s, do you think that there are truly a lot of students that not only you work with, but everybody works with are really have some of those challenges, but maybe they're just di not diagnosed. Yeah. And I think that COVID made things a lot trickier. You know, we, we put kids in boxes sometimes that because we had to, to keep them safe, you know, literally, literally sometimes like, Hey, this is your space. You mm -hmm. know, we stay in that space and we didn't allow kids to move as much. And we, we, we weren't able to allow kids to experience school the way that we normally did. And we have kids that didn't develop socially as much as they normally would because of just the reality of the world. And what I have really liked to be able to do applying in, in my classroom. And then also with the teachers that I coach is how can we, work with what we have and not mm -hmm. worry about, well, a third grader should be able to do this, or, you know, a second grader should be able to do this. All right. What, what, what are the students that we have in our classroom? What are their strengths? What are their areas for growth? How can we set them up for success? What kind of interventions can we take, can we put into our lessons? Um, even if it's something as simple as having over the ear headphones available yeah. and accessible, like what can we do that is really not a large ask for us as the teacher that can truly make or break a student's success in our classroom? Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, and, and on that same note, <laughs> no pun intended, I really didn't mean to, <laughs> to do that, but it worked. <laughs> um, you know, you, you talk a little bit in some of your other, you know, presentations and podcasts about having some of these same struggles, right? As a kid and growing up in music class. I mean, I know just, you know, with, with someone that didn't have a diagnosis, I struggled, right? In music and in art and that whole creative piece of who I was. And so how do you think that your own childhood and your own experience in school, um, you know, having some challenges that you've spoke about have really helped you in becoming this amazing teacher for all of these other students? What role has that played for you? I, I don't think we could make it any more. It, it really is comes down to the core of why I think I'm drawn to the elementary level is because I, I think the elementary level is where I struggle the most and where I feel like I wasn't quite understood. And by being able to put myself in the shoes of some of these students, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have one student, a kindergartner, who is really not able to control his body for the majority of the time. It's, you know, he's rarely able to stay in a spot or, you know, keep attention. And when you go through school constantly being corrected, it, it starts to really get under your skin. And, you know, one of these students, it's about this student about halfway through the year, I looked at him and said, hey, do you sometimes feel like you are getting in trouble for things that you really can't control? And the look on his face broke my heart because I felt that same thing where, he, where I, you truly feel like you are trying your absolute hardest and it's just not enough. And all you hear your every day or whenever you hear your name is someone correcting you or someone telling you something you're not doing right. And that is especially at the younger level, this is when we're letting them get those schemas of what school is and mm -hmm. what learning and education could be for them and how do we set them up for success for the rest of their lives is by making sure that we are teaching them strategies to ask for breaks, to use fidgets when appropriate, to, you know, if they see themselves getting overstimulated, grab a pair of headphones and just be aware of who they are and also advocate for themselves because 
there comes a time where they're going to have to advocate for themselves as yeah. individuals with unique needs. And we can't expect them to do that if we've never taught them how. Mm-hmm. And my own experience going through going through life as a neurodiverse individual has definitely had its ups and downs. And I remember I I would be fine at school. I would be hyperactive. I would be, you know, a little a little here and there, but I I wanted to pull it together because I was a people pleaser. I still am a people pleaser, but I wanted to do right. But then what would happen is I would get home and I would immediately explode. Mm -hmm. I would have breakdowns and tantrums every day after school because I was just so physically and emotionally and mentally exhausted from essentially masking all day. And by the time I got home, I just, I didn't have anything else in me. So that's why when I create my own classroom. And when I talk to teachers who are have want to create an accessible classroom is how can we allow these students to advocate for the things that we already have available for them in a way that isn't othering. So for instance, the over the headphones that I have, I have about 10 or 15 of those in my classroom and any student knows that they can use them at any time. It's, it's a little chaotic at the beginning, but, but once the novelty wears off, those students that are receiving benefits from that don't feel othered because of it. They feel like this is just something that they're that is available to them, but it's also available to everyone, and they weren't signaled out. And that is, I, it's been a huge change in my classroom, and I think that it's something that as teachers we need to try to do more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I can imagine that that has completely shifted the climate and culture in your classrooms, especially if you're not, I love the fact that you said you're not singling kids out, right? You don't have a student walk in that's maybe a neurodiverse student or has ADHD or has has some sort of challenge or disability. And you're like, oh, here's your headphones, you know, to kind of like everyone's now looking at them like they're different. And the fact that you're offering those resources because two reasons, one, you know, it's great that you're just making everything so inclusive for everyone, but two, there are probably other kids that need them and that can benefit from those that just have not been diagnosed with anything. So I think it's amazing that you're doing that. Um, I hope that, you know, some of the folks that are listening are thinking, oh, wow, why am I not doing that? It just makes sense. And it doesn't take any more effort. It doesn't cost any more money really, um, you know, to do those things. So I just applaud you for really true and being so in, being so intentional about what it is that you're doing. Um, so I want to ask you about play-based learning, because I think that sort of coincides with you talking about, you know, when you were a kid and having to sit and everything was, you know, sort of sit in your chair and sit in your desk and do what you're told to do. And then you go home and you have these explosions. Um, So how does play-based learning sort of assist students um, that potentially are struggling and even maybe kids that aren't? I, I like to think of it as if someone were to walk by my room (laughs) <laughs> what would they think is going on? Because the reality is, especially in my classroom, they could walk by and we could be doing anything. We could be jumping around like frogs, moving around. You know, we could be making all kinds of weird sounds and things like that. But the reality is, is we're laughing, we're having fun, mm-hmm. it's joyful. And when we have joyful experiences, when we have those experiences where we're truly engaged, that's where the real magic of learning happens. Not only that, but when students are truly engaged, when we're planning our lessons with the understanding that, hey, I have a lot of students in here that need to move. I'm not going to plan a 20-minute lesson where they're sitting down at the chalkboard. No, we're going to do maybe seven minutes and then get up and move to a different space. When we're doing these things that allow our students to be more successful, not only are we allowing our students to feel more involved, not only are we helping them receive a better education, but we're also cutting back on a lot of the classroom management struggles we tend to have, especially with those students who tend to be a little bit more hyperactive or might have sensory aversions and things like that. And the reality is, is that helps every single person in the school. And not only that, but it's also modeling the fact that there are people that are different in the world and everyone's not going to get the same thing necessarily but everyone has access to what they need to be successful. And the joy of what I do and what what, the way that I do the play-based learning is we're kind of tricking kids into learning because it's just fun. We're playing a game, but while they're playing the game, they're learning quarter notes, they're learning eighth notes, they're using their singing voice, they're engaging with the Italian terms, they're doing all these different things, but they're doing it in a way where they're not feeling, oh, I'm being tested here. Or, oh, Mr. Tarbit's watching me. He's going to write down a grade. I need to freak out. 
because what we're doing it in a way is just mimicking how kids interact with the world. Think about how babies learn. They learn by doing, they learn by picking things up, you know, putting them in their mouth, learning by mistakes. And that play-based learning, I think we, I think we as a society have figured out that preschool play-based learning is wonderful in preschool, but for whatever reason we get to kindergarten. And a lot of times it's like, nope, we're going to do math reading and we're going to, and it's just, it's not developmentally appropriate and play-based learning can be incredibly rigorous. The problem is, is it doesn't always look like that. So Mm -hmm. we, it comes down to us as teachers, sometimes having to advocate and educate the stakeholders that this might look like we're just playing games and singing all day or, you know, whatever you're doing, but there's so much more to it that really is helping us meet the goals of our, the instructional goals, Mm -hmm. as well as the emotional goals for our kids. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage that, right? Because I know a lot of teachers are listening. They're like, oh yeah, play-based learning. They're jumping around and singing and having fun. But if I let my kids do that in my music class, they would just be out of control and there would be behaviors and they'd be bumping into each other. You know, I can, I can sort of see, you know, some of, some of the teachers thinking that right now as you're talking. So how do you manage to keep the balance of the play-based learning and allowing children to be up and free and moving without having the behavior issues or, you know, the struggles in the classroom with kids acting inappropriately. The good news, bad news situation is (laughs) that I I like to think of what makes good teaching as these five pillars, what I call the five pillars of elementary music success. Um, It's having the classroom management. It's understanding the pedagogy. It's understanding how to use assessment and differentiation. And also how to make sure that we as teachers are still fulfilled and not burn out. The great thing about this is when you work on one pillar, you really help the others. So if you are working on adding new pedagogy and finding new ideas and new lessons and implementing play-based learning, that's going to help with the classroom management. The problem is, is if you're struggling with classroom management, applying the new pedagogy is going to be really hard. And it really is this process of incremental changes, of taking baby steps to create this big leap that allows the students over time to create this big macro change. It's not necessarily going in and changing everything all of a sudden so that you have a completely unrecognizable classroom. Mm -hmm. It's understanding that you are going to turn the ship by degrees, but also understanding that sometimes we as teachers need to accept a little bit of chaos in that transition time. So for instance, when I first implemented fidgets to everyone, it was a little bit chaotic because everyone all of a sudden has these fidgets in their hand. But like I said before with the -the over-the-ear headphones, as the novelty wore off, it became a tool that students that needed it could use. And it wasn't necessarily a distraction to those that really didn't care anymore because, oh, well, we already did that. That's that's Mm -hmm. old news. And it really comes down to taking these small changes, thinking, where can I make the most impact in the decisions? And I think truly that often comes down to meeting the base needs of the students. So honestly, the biggest change that I've ever made in my classroom was making it sensory accessible. Mm -hmm. That has cut down on so much of my classroom management issues, which has allowed me to have more trust for my students, which allows them to trust me more, which allows us to get through more pedagogy. And it's just this cycle where when we start making these small changes, these big chain reactions can happen. Yeah. Yeah. So along that same line, I know being in an elementary school and you see hundreds of kids, right? Because they filter in each class comes in for, you know, their, their music time every week or every day. Um, So I know you have to have students that just are not into music. They're maybe a little resistant. Maybe they think music isn't for me. I don't want to sing. I don't want to play an instrument. So what are some things that you do to really try to pull those kids in and they may not be a behavior issue, right? They may just be sitting there thinking, I don't, I don't care about music. This isn't for me. Um, How do you get those? How do you inspire those kids? And how do you really challenge them to see the different pieces of, or the different parts of music that they can be interested in? What, what makes the most impact is what makes most impact in learning overall, which is just making it relevant. You know, I, I'm not saying that I'm a music teacher that only uses popular music or anything like that in the classroom, but there there are a lot of teachers that refuse to bring in music that the kids might listen to at home into their classroom Mm -hmm. because for whatever reason, um, that's a different different soapbox to get (laughs) on. That's a different episode. But but the reality is, is whenever we can make the learning that's happening in our classroom relevant to the kids, 
that's going to be so much more impactful for them. Yeah. Um, I know for me, typically, it tends to be the boys as they get a little bit older, tend to get a little bit more standoffish. And one thing that I found that can be really helpful is to make it a competition. Find games that have some sort of competition or something or physical aspect of it. That can be a lot of it. Or, you know, what can we do for kids that don't like to sing? You know, I love to sing, but I know that's not everyone's thing. And if we're only going to judge their musicality based on their singing, Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're not, we're not really doing that. We're, we're judging their singing. And there are so many people that make music and listen to music and what I call um, active listeners. And they, they participate in music by listening and by understanding and hearing things that we don't, you know, we might not all hear, but overall it creates this community of music making that we understand that we all have different roles in this musical world mm -hmm. and some of that sometimes people will never take music after my class they'll they'll leave elementary school and they'll, they'll leave middle school and they'll, they'll they won't take band or choir and that'll be it so how do we get them to understand that even if they never do band or choir or orchestra that they still have a role in the arts which is appreciating it understanding it being patrons of the arts and i think whatever we can do to take what's going on outside of our classroom and bring it in that's where the real magic happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how do you share that with the classroom teachers, right? Because the kids will come to you for an hour a week or whatever your schedule might look like. And then they go back into their general classrooms. Do you see a lot of breakdown in um, what you do in music and then what they're doing in the regular classroom? Or is there a way that you've really um, gotten good at working with the classroom teachers and, and pairing what you're both doing so that it kind of flows back into that classroom because only an hour, is it an hour? Is that what you get? Uh, typically for? my classes are 40 minutes. 40? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it a week? More or less, depending on the yeah, year. Yeah. So I mean, 40 minutes, especially if it's like a kid's most favorite thing, right? If they really look forward to your music class and they only get that once a week, how do you sort of keep that energy going once they leave and go back into the classroom? Well, the reality is, is a lot of time the system is is set up against us. Right. Um, we I jokingly refer to it as being stuck on Music Teacher Island because a lot of times we are the only music teachers in the building. And depending mm -hmm. on the district, we might be the only music teacher in the district. Mm -hmm. And the reality, like you said before, we have hundreds of students. We have to differentiate. We have to do grades. We have to do this, that, the other thing. And the reality is, is the classroom teachers are just as busy. They're doing all these other things that aren't necessarily on our plates, but are going to keep them busy. So it, I've more or less forced myself into conversation sometimes because I understand that it isn't necessarily on the second grade teachers, it isn't necessarily on their radar to make sure what I, they're doing is matching me. I have a lot of flexibility in my lessons, which is great. So what can I do to engage the other, the, what's going on outside? One of my favorite things I did um, with my second grade class was my first year of teaching was we had a performance it, towards the end of the year. And I went to the second grade teacher and said, I said, Hey, what are you going to be working on at this time of year curriculum wise? At that point, they were working on the water cycle. So I'm like, I can work with water. So I found a bunch of songs about water, rain, sunshine, all, you know, things, different things related to the water cycle. And we turned it into a performance that showed the water cycle through song. So between each song, we would have a student read their own writing of what they learned about this phase of the water cycle. And we were able to show that everything was cyclical and that we were able to go through the water cycle through music, which I thought was a really cool way to, to connect the two. Because the reality is, is the system oftentimes is working against us and oftentimes pits us against each other yeah. when we really are on the same team. So often mm -hmm. we can get into the, the comparison of, well, you know, music teachers, they don't have to, they're not a tested subject, so they have it easy. Mm -hmm. Or classroom teachers, they only have 20 students or 30 students, so they have it easy. The reality is we all have it very hard <laughs> and we're all <laughs> trying to work together to do the best we can with what we have. Yeah. How did you manage that? Because you brought up COVID earlier. So how did you manage teaching all things music during COVID? Like how difficult was that? It was a little wild. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to lie. You know, for the majority of one of the years, we weren't able to sing. Um, we weren't able to share instruments. We weren't able to dance. We weren't able. It, it was rough. I'll be honest. My goals during, you know, the first, you know, the year or two of COVID was I'm probably not going to get to all the standards. My yeah. goal is to keep the love of music alive mm -hmm. so that when restrictions start opening back up, 
I haven't lost the kids. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to drill something into them and say, we're learning, we're learning this because this is what the state says I have to and make it so not joyful. And just, yeah. I want them to be able to I wanted them to be able to love it so that when we had the opportunity to make music in a way more similar to the way that is ideal, they would still be there to follow me. Yeah. And I think for the most part, we've made it through. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like you were doing a really good job because like you said, like kids connect music is really about emotional connection, right? It's like feeling something inspiration. It's not, it's usually not about dates and times of a composer and things like that. I mean, those are all great things to know, but that's not really what gets to the heart of a student, you know, or a child when they're singing or, you know, trying to sing or loving to sing, but maybe they can't sing. It's, it's really about that, that connection piece. So um, speaking of uh, all things wonderful that you're doing, let's jump over to your online um, business, the that music teacher. So let's talk a little bit about what you're doing there, what you have there for teachers, your podcast, and like just what are some of the amazing things that are happening with that? For sure. So that music teacher is a business that started completely by accident and started out as in that gap year where I was teaching outside of the music classroom, I missed the music classroom. So I created an Instagram account just so I could follow a bunch of other music teachers and kind of live vicariously, vicariously through them. And then it turned into this chronicle of, of my first year of teaching, which turned into this. I mean, essentially I have every day of my teaching career archived in this journal online on Instagram. And it just, it kept on spiraling and I kept understanding, kept on realizing that there was such a need for more community for elementary music teachers and more content specific professional development. Um, for instance, this past summer, we hosted the first ever elementary music summit and which was this online conference. And honestly, I was like, I'll have a couple hundred people here because I'm like, if I can get a couple hundred people to get their, get content specific professional development, let's be honest, our districts aren't providing, I will feel good about the impact they've had. I knew there was a need and the community was like, yes, there is a need. We had over 2,400 people show up wow. to the summit this past summer. And it, it really shows that that music teacher island is real and that mm -hmm. people feel like they are so isolated and they're really just trying to tread water a lot of the time. And that is somehow become my biggest form of self-care. I love doing, I love running my business. You know, yes, I work a lot when I get home from school, but it really is something that I truly find joy in. And seeing the impact that I'm having on classrooms that are not just my own really make my, my teacher hurtful. Mm -hmm. Well, and knowing that, you know, April is autism awareness month. And so what, what, what do you want, if you could leave, uh, you know, just classroom music teachers with any advice or strategies for really trying to include all of those kids in to their classroom? Cause I know sometimes they, they, maybe they feel that they're not confident in how to reach those kiddos and things of that nature. Like what are some strategies or some advice that you would give music teachers to really include everybody in their classroom? Well, I have a couple different answers to that. The first one I'll give, I'll focus more on the practical, which is try something. Don't let the fear of making a mistake get in the way. I know that there it can be really scary to try something because you don't want to you don't want it to come off the wrong way or you don't want it to come off as othering or this that and the other thing. The reality is that you're going to make a, bu a bunch of mistakes. But if you're choosing not to try any implementations, you're just saying, "Well, I I, can't, I don't want to differentiate or I don't want to try to differentiate because I've never done it and I don't know what you know I could go wrong." If we're choosing not to do those things, we are choosing to allow students to not be able to allow our, to access our curriculum. And that's not okay. Try something, seek information, see what happens. On a more philosophical approach, treat every student like you wanted to be treated. Understand that you, your life experiences are different from theirs. They're coming in with different baggage than you would have had. They're coming in with different experiences in life that have shaped them into the way they are. And the reality is when it comes to neurodiversity is the whole point is for us to be, a, be aware that we're, we're all different. So how can we ensure that everyone has the tools they need to be successful in a way that is really focusing on building up the understanding that different is just different. It's not weird. It's not bad. It's not less than, it's not more than, it truly is just different. 
mm-hmm. and, and to embrace the difference. I'm so proud of who I am as a neurodiverse individual. I think it shaped myself so much as, uh, as an uncle, as, as a, a teacher, as an individual. And I think it's also just one of those things where I wouldn't have this business if it weren't for my ADHD hyperfixations, you know, yeah. whether or not it was a hyperfixation, I, I love what I do and I love what I'm able to do because of it. And I truly think that neurodiversity can be a superpower if we set people up in a way that they know how to use it that way. Yeah, that's amazing. I absolutely love that. Where can our listeners get in touch with you? Where can they find you? What's your best contact for um, them coming to you for assistance? Well, if you like listening to podcasts, listening to that music podcast is um, would be my my first recommendation. Um, weekly episodes every Wednesday. Um, other than that, reach out to me on Instagram at that music teacher. Again, I love having these conversations, so feel free to reach out and we can continue this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much, Bryson. This has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. I really appreciate all the work that you're doing um, in the music classroom. We need that. <laughs> badly um, in in where we are in education right now. So you're just kind of like this bright light. Um, So thank you so much for taking the time to be here and have this conversation with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And this is Christy Hool signing off for this episode of the Classroom Matters podcast. And don't forget to check out all of our great resources on the educate.today website.